Good morning, Arbor Heights. Welcome. I hope you came uh, ready to worship the Lord. Um, those who are out in the entryway, if you want to make your way in, that'd be great. Um, and I'm going to say a prayer. You can all stand, and I'm going to say a prayer. Oh, Father, I thank you for today. Father, I thank you for the freedom to come and worship with these people. Lord God, I pray that, pray that you would bless our time this morning, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move through this place. And I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear what Jake has, what you have to say through Jake this morning, Father. We love you and we worship you. In your name, amen. So we've had a, a little bit of a change. Um, Carla was supposed to lead worship, but Carla has no voice. So Carly has graciously, uh, you know, <laughs> said she would come and help me out this morning. So I am so grateful. Thank Carly you. Carly for Carla. <laughs> yes. So we're going to start with a song, okay? coming on the clouds kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's rolling Make way before the King of Kings, the God who comes to save is here to set the captives free, who can stop the Lord Almighty, our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah, he's roaring bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord?
beautiful day. Uh, I'm not going to get quite so hot today. Welcome to Arbor Heights Community Church. Happy to see every one of you here today. Uh, make sure you say hello to everybody before you leave. Uh, I think there's a chance for you to accomplish that, and uh, we're just happy to have you here this morning. May the Lord bless our service, give us a great time together, and uh, we have an announcement. Uh, first, I want to point out to you uh, the Connect card. Uh, if you are new to us today, uh, share some information with us, or even if you've had a change of information or want to connect with the leadership, that's on the back. Uh, this is a great way to do it, and you can leave it in the giving station as you leave. Um, I have a few announcements that I want to share with you. Um, first of all, movie night, outdoor movie night, is our next uh, big event. Um, so we set up a screen out in, uh, in Ark Park and we serve dinner ahead of time and we invite the community to come and watch a movie. And as of this week, uh, we have chosen the movie thanks to the youth student leadership team and we are going to see How to Train Your Dragon. Um, and so if you're not familiar with it, you know, boy, awkward, doesn't fit in, eventually changes the whole thing. Anyway, it's a great movie. Um, so eventually uh, invite your, your friends, your community, come and join us. Um, it's a lot of fun. So that's August 26th. Um, also, it's a great time to sign up for church camp. Um, that's the other slide. There you go. And uh, we're going to head south and have a weekend of camping together. It's also in connection with the Youth Sandblast Summer Retreat. And so it's just a great time. We're on a lake. We get to play in the water. Just great community and a great time together. So I encourage you to do that. There's a QR code you can sign up with or there's a sign-up sheet on the Connect Desk. Lastly, you probably, actually not lastly, because I now have four announcements, but you probably saw as you came in, there was a table in the back. You might not have seen it, um, but we've got a table of Mariner's memorabilia um, that was gifted for a purpose, um, and we have some leftovers. So if you're a Mariner's fan, or you've got a favorite player, or that kind of thing, check out the table. Those things are free to take if something interests you. Um, and so there's right behind the sound booth, so help yourself. Also, the Mariner's game that we're going to as a church is this next Saturday. So if you are signed up to go and you haven't paid for your tickets, now's the time. Um, if you signed up and you're not gonna go, let me know. If you didn't sign up but you might be interested in going, talk to me as well, because um, we might have extra tickets. Um, and so, yeah, that's Saturday. As Lastly, you may have noticed a green insert in your bulletin. I want to draw that to your attention. Um, we have a couple service opportunities. One, um, you'll hear more about it in the weeks to come, but we have a missionary couple that is coming to visit and share with us on August 13th. We're looking for um, someone to host them. Um, and so there's some, a little information there on that insert and uh, who you can contact if you are interested in that. And then also, we've had babies, we've had some people in the hospital. You have the opportunity to provide a meal if you are able. And so there are two opportunities that are listed there on that insert. Um, take a look at that as well. Um, I'm going to invite up Alessandra to give our offering. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm going to share from Deuteronomy 8, 10 through 18 before I pray for our offering this morning. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So let us, um, let it be our prayer this morning that we 
don't forget um, who was walking through us with in our wilderness or who is currently walking through it, um, through our wilderness with us. And um, let's just um, make sure to not be quick to forget uh, those times when God has provided for us. I know it's very easy to um, get through something and want to put it behind us, but let's remember those precious moments where God has been um, guiding us and been by our side. So let's go ahead and pray over the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much um, for this beautiful day you blessed us with, and we just thank you that we can gather here and worship you together, Lord. And I just pray that um, as we continue our worship and our giving this morning, um, that you would give us that gentle reminder that you've always um, been walking with us and you will continue to do so, and that it is um, through you that we have everything that we do have, Lord. Um, and I just pray um, over the gift and the giver this morning, Lord, um, in your precious name. Amen. I welcome you to stand again. In this first song, it's called Holy Spirit, and I would just encourage you to welcome him in this morning. You know, it says, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overwhelmed by your presence, Lord. May he overwhelm us this morning as we worship. There is nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your our living shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from always oh, my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow. the children to go downstairs for the children's time. We're going to pray for them before they go. And as we do that, I want you to look around and see who leaves the audience as, as children today. They're not the future church, by the way. They're the church of today. 
and they're part of our church and we need to be supporting them and praying for them. So take a look around as they leave and pick one of them out and start praying for them this week that God will develop in them his character, that he'll develop uh, new servants of his and that they'll be used in God's ministry in the future. So children, you are dismissed. Let's have a word of prayer before you go. Father, we thank you that you've entrusted to us the lives of these young people who are part of your ministry, part of your church, and are part of our congregation and part of our family. We thank you for them, Lord. Now, as they go downstairs, may they hear from you. Lord, will you bless the teachers, guide the teachers, and bless each one of the children who are there today that they will hear what you have to say to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, kids, now you're free to go. You've got a mic. Okay. Okay. Uh, today's scripture reading is from Matthew 14. <clears throat> it's the story of Jesus walking on the water. Immediately, he made the disciples go into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus reached, immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be with us today. Let us be people of great faith. Challenge us when we are people of little faith. Be with us today as we enjoy your word and dive into you and give us this wonderful opportunity to worship you, almighty God, in Jesus' name, amen. It's interesting when a pastor's away, as John is, how many people come forth and help out with other things and do things that we never find out their capabilities until we have a great need. And then all of a sudden, we discover some new talent and some new people that God is using and wants to use in our congregation. This morning we have with us, uh, I'm going to call you pastor, uh, Jake Beatty. Jake has been with us before. Uh, he has some new twist in the story. Uh, first of all, I'll ask him how many children he has. For those of you who don't know, he has seven. Four, four girls and three boys. I don't know their names. I apologize for that. Uh, Jake just finished his interview for licensing and has received his li license to be in a, a pastor at church in the Northwest. So... And very near future, he has an interview as a candidate for a possible pastorate in North Bellingham uh, just in a couple of weeks. So be praying for him, uh, knowing the message, but also be praying for him the next couple of weeks as he prepares for the interview and that God would direct him into the ministry that he has for him. Jake? You've got a microphone. I sure do. Yeah, look at that. I brought it with me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that's pretty scary, pretty exciting. Uh, three weeks ago, I had a, a very unique church experience. I've uh, been going to church my whole life, and I had never seen this happen before. Uh, 
Pastor Todd at the Blaine Church, Northwood, um, had begun his message, and he was maybe this far into it when Jack came down the center aisle with his dog up to the raised area. It's a, and was, he started, he interrupted the sermon, Jack did. And he'd had a little to drink, uh, it turned out later, my nose told me. Um, and he was upset. He was distressed. He was distraught. He was having a very hard time. Uh, he had come at the request of the baby mama from Las Vegas to Blaine to help with their son, a four-year-old boy. And they had had another fight, another fight. And I don't know, he said that the alcohol came after. Maybe it was before. It's not the first time that he'd had a fight. And he just couldn't handle it. He couldn't do life with the girlfriend and with his son anymore. And he was most upset about he needed to get back to Las Vegas and he didn't have any money to buy a plane ticket and he couldn't afford to get himself and his dog there. What's he going to do? So I, I, I'm sitting out there in, in the seats watching this happen while Pastor Todd is tr you know, trying to do a sermon and like, okay, is he dangerous? Right? Is, is he going to cause trouble? Uh, this guy's hurting. Like all these different thoughts I'm, I'm wrestling with as I'm sitting there. This guy's hurting and we need to be of service to him. We have, a, we have a flow, you know, like things happen on Sunday in a certain order and we don't like watch the clock super tight, but it's just the way that things go. So uh, Todd called some elders up and we escorted Jack to listen and to allow the service to continue and to find out what his needs would be and how we could maybe meet them. Uh, my wife told me later, she said, hey, I was reading this book with the girls, In His Steps, by Charles Sheldon. Anybody heard of it? In His Steps. It was written in 1896. Uh, and the publisher, when they first put it out, forgot to copyright it or they, they made some sort of a mistake and so it was pirated immediately by tons of publishers. So the word went out, and there's maybe more than 50 million copies that have been sold of this book. And it's from this book that the phrase, what would Jesus do, has come to us. And here's how the story begins. Right here at, at the very start uh, Reverend Henry, Henry Maxwell is preparing his sermon on Friday for Sunday's message. And he gets a knock on a door and a, a guy's asking for help. And he's like, I'm kind of busy, you know, be warm and well fed. And he finishes, his, he finishes his sermon prep. Sunday morning, he comes up to the pulpit and he's preaching. And he gets further through his message than Todd did. But he was interrupted by this guy who had knocked on his door on Friday asking for help, who comes up and says, I'm not complaining. I just need to let you people know you have not been very helpful. I've been looking for work. I've been out of work for a while. I'm not a bad guy. I'm struggling, and you haven't been helping me. And then he keeled over, and three days later he died. And that guy's name was Jack. Jack came up and interrupted the service. And so, Pastor Maxwell is thinking, because he's challenged by Jack, who's come up and asked for help, what would Jesus have done on Friday? Would he have continued preparing the message? Or would he have tried to find a way to get involved in Jack's life and to serve him? And so, uh, Pastor Maxwell has got a, a decent church with a bunch of decent folks in a decent neighborhood and regular attendance, and everything's just going smooth, right? Everything is fine. Don't, don't rock the boat. Well, Jack comes up and rocks the boat, and so he challenges his congregation to not make a decision, make a pledge for the next year. Don't do anything without asking yourself, in this situation, what would Jesus do? We at Northwood, 
were interrupted by a guy named Jack challenging us to maybe think, what would Jesus do? But this passage today that we're going to look at in Matthew of Jesus walking on the water and then Peter walking on the water, um, you know, the WWJD thing made a resurgence in the 90s, and people were wearing the bracelets and had the t-shirts and the hats, and it was a youth leader in the Midwest somewhere. I think they were familiar with the book, but they brought it back and it spread out. I'd like to propose a little variation on the theme today. What would Peter do? What would Peter do? And so, as we read the passage and as we look at the verses, we have an idea of who we think Peter is, right? He's an impetuous guy. Uh, He's taking these crazy risks. But maybe there's something for us in looking at his story. And if I do this okay, I'll tie it all up at the end with, with our jacks, okay? It's worth knowing, oh wait, should I pray? I should pray. You see how new I am to all this? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for speaking uh, your love to us through your word and through Jesus, the word incarnate for giving your life for us, for dying for us. We do not deserve your sacrifice. And Lord, we respond to it by repenting and asking for your forgiveness and pleading for reconciliation with you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to me, speak through me, and I speak to me too, uh, speak through me today uh, to this blessed church uh, that they would hear your message in these words, pray that you would receive all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. It's worth mentioning, I think, that this particular passage of Matthew, where Jesus uh, immediately Jesus makes the disciples get in the boat, go on ahead of him to the other side, right prior is the feeding of the 5,000. 5,000 men plus women and children, probably 15,000 people with five muffins and two sardines. What Jesus had, and then just before that, John the Baptist was beheaded. And I think that they're on this side of the lake, the Capernaum side of the lake, about eight miles in width, when when they hear about John the Baptist being beheaded. And Jesus is upset. He loved John, cousin, born right around the same time as him. And he's upset. And he's like, let's go, guys. I need, to get, I need to get alone for a minute. And they go across the lake to the other side. And he's going to mourn. But the crowds have heard. And they follow around and they come over to the other side of the lake. And so Jesus puts his mourning on hold for a minute. He has compassion on them. And he serves them. And he speaks to them. And we find out they're hungry. And the disciples are like, get these people out of here. They need food. Jesus says, you feed them. We don't have anything. And so then the miracle of the feeding of the five or the 15,000 happens. And then once they're fed, he sends them away again and he sends the disciples. Maybe I should show you this side because you can't see me, Tracy. I think. Come across the lake. Go, go back to Capernaum and I'll catch up with you. But I'm going to pray. And so he goes up to the mountain to mourn. This is my theory. In any case, he's alone and he's praying. And based on the timing and the time of the the day that it happens, uh, he goes up uh, in the evening. So by evening, it says he was already alone in verse 25. And he goes walking, he goes to catch up with the disciples and he gets there between 3 and 6 a.m. So the fourth watch of the night, the fourth three-hour period that begins at sundown. And so he'd been praying for a long time, and the disciples have been rowing or sailing for a long time. Eight miles on the water, not that far, okay? It should not take them from evening until 4.37 in the morning to get across. So by the time Jesus is catching up with them walking on the water, they've been, he's been praying a long time, and they've been working a long time, and they're tired, and there's some real stress. So then they see him. 
it's just light enough so that they can see a shape and, and recognize that it's a man, but dark enough that they don't know who it is or what kind of a man it is. And so, typical of the disciples, they completely freak out. They're terrified, like it's a scream, you know, we're all going to die kind of a scream. Uh, they can't get across the lake, it's stormy, they've been at this a long time, and now there's a ghost come to kill us. Awesome, cherry on top of the day for us, you know? Peter's in this situation with the disciples, what would Peter do? What does Peter do in this situation? First, now I feel sort of pastoral. I got four words and they all start with the same letter. How about that, huh? I, I don't always do this uh, and a lot of times when I've done it, I've asked for help. Hey there, professor, what, what do I do here? And he's like, bang, bang, bang. I'm like, cool. Well, this time... I prayed. I prayed and got the download, okay? The first L, Peter would be looking. Peter is looking. This is not a whole lot different from the disciples in the boat, but he's in the boat, and we'll, we'll draw this out a little bit more. Peter's looking intently to see Jesus apart from where he is, apart from his experience right now. Peter would be looking And then, when he recognizes Jesus, he asks to come to him. But the first thing we, sh we should notice is that uh, I, I don't mind startling my girls every now and then, give them a little boo, a spook, scare thing. This is not Jesus' intent, though. As he's walking across the water to the disciples and they see him and they freak out, he says, courage, it's me. Be calm. It's all right. Don't, don't be afraid. He doesn't let them stay in their fear for a long time. So he says right away in his compassion, I'd like to let you, it's me, be calm. So when Peter sees Jesus walking on the storm, he's longing. This is his next L. What would Peter do? The disciples see him. Peter sees him. He's looking intently. Now Peter is longing to be out there where Jesus is. Rather than, maybe like the disciples, Jesus, you come to me. Here I am, you come to me. The boat is in stormy water. Could you stop the storm? Just make it stop. You come to me in my boat where I am, but Peter, rather, wants to go out where Jesus is. And so he asks Jesus, if that's you, Jesus, you said it's me, courage, it's me, Tell me to come to you. I'm not sure this is the best test, actually, because anybody out there could say, yeah, come on out. It happens in this case that it was Jesus. Jesus did call him. So, is this, does this make a lot of sense? Is this a good, is this wise, is this wisdom, caution, prudence, or is this Peter? impulsive, silly, rash. Do you, do you remember the three disciples that are in the, that are tightest with Jesus? Peter, James, and John. Some of the characteristics that they had. Uh, sons of thunder, like when they get insulted, they're like, God, should we call down fire to roast these guys? No. But they, with their attitude, are the ones that are tightest with Jesus. I kind of want to be that guy. I want to be like that. I want I want to be tight. I want to be in the in the inner circle with Jesus. I and maybe God's built me right cuz there's some impulsivity that I have too. So I just want to encourage all of you to be impulsive. Um, the rest of the disciples though are too stunned to move. And they're not, they're, not asking, they're not asking to join Jesus, right? They're, they don't have the longing that Peter has to be out where Jesus is. What would Peter do? Peter would be looking. Peter would be longing. He's now distinguishing himself from the disciples. 
What does Peter do next? Peter leaps in an L word. So he responds. He initiates, and Jesus says, yeah, come on out. Come be with me. Peter's a sailor. He's a fisherman. He works on boats. If he'd paused to think at all, he knows how foolish it is to step off the, the known to the unknown. We all know, you don't even need to be a fisherman to know that you can't walk on water. When Peter is looking out there to see Jesus, and he asks, if it's you, call me to come to you, his desire is to be with Jesus. It is not to walk on the water. He didn't ask Jesus to give me the power to walk on the water. I'd like to see a miracle. A lot of times, the Pharisees would say that to Jesus, right? You give us a sign. Give us a sign to prove you are who you say you are, and then we will believe you. Jesus doesn't do it because they're after the sign, not after the miracle giver, right? They're after the miracle, not the miracle maker. Peter's not after the miracle, and he gets one in all the scriptures, a lot of stuff happens with water, parting of the Red Sea, uh, the floating of the axe head, but only two people walk on the water, Jesus and Peter. And it's not, he's not looking to walk on the water, he's looking to be with Jesus. So he gets a miracle in the pursuit of the miracle maker. What would... Peter do next? Maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but it's an L word and it works. Peter would be learning. So he's walked out on the water, he's, seen, he's headed toward Jesus, and it says that he sees the wind, he sees the effect of the wind, he sees the waves, the storm, <gasps> blunk. So he no longer has the problem of walking on the water. Now he's sinking. He cries out immediately to Jesus, and Jesus is there to grab him. Doesn't hesitate, doesn't wait. Jesus, save me, and he gets saved. I'd like to imagine, as impulsive as Peter is, that in the future there's some reflection. And he's thinking back on this experience. How did that go? How could it have gone better? We know from the rest of the stories in the scripture about Peter, that he does not uh, give up on boldness. He doesn't stop taking risks. He has found a way, though, through seeing the crucifixion and then resurrection of the Lord, he has seen uh, that placing his confidence in Christ is uh, a worthy place to do it. Like, this guy can bear the load. I can lean on him, and he will hold me, and he will support me. And I can stay focused on him, and I won't be taken down by the waves of the sea and the storm. And he's able to focus on Jesus, so he has learned. This story, uh, when, when Peter does um, cry out, Jesus is there to catch him, and he responds and says, "'You have little faith. Why did you doubt?' And what I like to believe that Jesus is saying is, and yet you did have faith. You had faith, Peter. You, you were doing it. Why did you start doubting? Trust me. Continue to trust in me. The story ends in worship. They bow down in submission. They recognize Jesus as Lord. So even those disciples who at the beginning are terrified, Jesus grabs Peter, they step into the boat, and they fall down in worship. We ask ourselves the question, what would Peter do? Because we might be in these similar kinds of situations. What will you do? Will you be looking? Will you be looking for Jesus in the world? It's my proposition that, and maybe you've experienced this, our lives are maybe like a boat. And as a former sailor, I would gravitate toward this kind of analogy. 
and we're pretty safe in the boat, relatively safe in the boat of our family, in the boat of our job, uh, in the boat of our church. And the world's stormy. There's trouble out there. And we experience some trouble. If you know any of more of my story, the four babies of ours that are in heaven, you know that I've experienced trouble. And you've got your own stories. So I'm not saying that we're perfectly safe, but there is a safety component to the way that we live our lives, and we don't need to be looking for Jesus out there in the world. It's possible to ignore Jack. It's possible to have Jack come in, ask for help, be escorted out, and helped be by the elder. But Jesus is out there in the world. He's out there in the world where it's stormy, where the waves are big, where people are struggling, where people like Jack want to get back home, need to be encouraged to stay connected with their girlfriend and son. And other scenarios. Will you be like Peter and be looking? Will you have your eyes open, please? Will you please have your eyes open to look outside the church, outside your work, outside your family for the storm, the darkness, and to see if Jesus is there? Peter longs to be with Jesus out there in the storm. Will you be longing with him? If you've begun looking and you see, oh, Jesus is out there, there are opportunities to serve out there, do you want to serve? Do you want to get out of the comfortable, the illusion of predictability, the illusion of of safety that you have in your, in your boat, in your comfortable, well-defined? Do you want to be out there where Jesus is helping the hurting? Maybe you don't. I would think if that's the case, the place to start would be to say, Lord, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable being comfortable. I don't want to get out of the boat. I don't want you to mess with my world, just being honest. I don't want to be uncomfortable. But here's the baby step I can give you, Lord. Could you make me uncomfortable with your comfort, please? Could you stir up, you stir up, some longing in my heart to serve? I will acknowledge intellectually that service is important and maybe the superior path and Christ-likeness looks like entering into people's icky experiences. Jesus as God came from heaven to this world, and we mirror him when we step into other people's. I kind of don't want that, Lord, but I'd like to want it. I want to want it. Can you help me with that? I think this is a place to start. And be like Peter. What would Peter do? He'd be looking for Jesus in the world. He'd be longing to participate with Jesus where he is, and then he would leap He would come up and sing with moment's notice. How cool is that? He would be involved. He would jump in in the church service where it needs help. He would see what he could do to help with Jack and get him and his dog home. And where does your girlfriend live? And do they need some more help? To leap to take the step, to be afraid, 
what would Peter do? Part of the inner circle, tight with Jesus. When he leaps, if you've ever experienced a miracle, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool thing to be a part of. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, I think, you know, just a, a common thing. Maybe the, the missionaries that are coming that need to be hosted soon, there's an opportunity there. I just had to mention that. Uh, I bet you they have stories of God's miraculous provision. They're running right up against this challenge, like they need another $5,000 or $500, and where is it going to come from? I don't know. God said to go. Like the Indiana Jones that movie. He steps out. It's always been there. They didn't see it, but the God has made provision. And those are cool experiences to get out of the comfortable boat to look where Jesus is, to be engaged with him in serving the world and see him provide and to step out onto what wasn't there and have it be there, to walk on the water. You can walk on the water. Not because you want to walk on the water, but because you want to walk out to where Jesus is on the water and you will have these stories and these experiences. If you haven't had it, it's really cool. And if you have, you know what I mean. Peter would be learning. Man, I wish I could tell you. Just have faith. And you step out on that water and all of a sudden it's flat calm like a birch bay sunset kind of thing. And you just walk on that water and it's maybe just a little squishy. But you know that's not true. It's hard. There's adversity. You can get splashed in the face by a big wave. Maybe. And there'll be a a sink moment. And like, God, why did you let this happen? I, I did all the first three L's. Brace yourself. Brace yourself for it. Prepare for trouble, for adversity, with time in the Word and prayer and learning to be sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And be sure of this. Jesus will catch you when you fall. When you sink, cry out. And He will save you. He will save you. And think of what together you and Jesus can do to advance the kingdom. And hear him say, good job, faithful servant. Good job. I'll close with a personal story. Uh, I'd been a sponsor of children through Compassion International for many years, and through some travel I'd seen some the storms of poverty in the world. And I knew Jesus was out there, a, a source of hope for the hurting. And I wanted to be a part. I was longing, like Peter, to participate with Jesus in helping to alleviate some of that suffering. And so when I got a chance, I was invited to go see one of the boys that I sponsor, and he was in Bolivia. Um, I decided I wanted to go. I'd been living at the cabin in Chelan, Boy, it suited me. I was like, a, I'm like a low-grade hermit. And, uh, you know, junior varsity level sort of thing. I couldn't really pull off the full deal, but I tried pretty hard. I love splitting firewood. Yeah, it's great. And I had begun to develop some discomfort with my comfort. Like, this is the perfect life for me. I enjoyed my job. I was involved in service at the church, working with the youth. Why would I want to get out of here? What, what is it about this that... Well, I went on the trip, and I learned about this beautiful blonde from Texas who'd started an orphanage in Bolivia. That's not why I went. I mean, it was part of it, but it wasn't the full thing, okay? It wasn't the full reason. And 
it progressed enough that I felt like I should move. So I leapt and I, and I stepped out. I, I quit my job at the hospital. I left my comfortable cabin and I went to South America. And I thought that my cabin life was going to prepare me for South America because rustic and no electricity and you run the generator to get some water and that it was a city, a big city. And today on the way, we came to an intersection and a, a big dump truck full of tires had stopped at the stop sign just before us and accelerated through and was belching out tons of black smoke. Oh, it felt like Bolivia. Every vehicle is doing that there. I really like the clear air thing. Like, if you don't know what we have here, this is incredible. I was sick all the time. I started teaching science, and I tell you, I sank. I was in over my head. I, I came in with a lot of pride, a lot of arrogance. I can do this. I can talk up front to kids. <laughs> Wow, that was hard. The richest of South America, the richest in Bolivia, they don't need chemistry. They don't need biology or physics. They're not impressed that I was a captain one time driving a ship. They're in a landlocked country. I had no control. I was so out of control, I sank. Save me, I cried. And Jesus gave me an idea. The math teacher would discipline his students by making them write pages of eights. Like, that's a total drag. That's just like a straight drag. What if there's something edifying from it? So I developed these sentences for how showing up on time demonstrates respect and how not cheating uh, but being honest uh, reveals your integrity and so on. So I had these various sentences, how... Um, not talking out of turn, or when you do talk out of turn, how disruptive it is and how disrespectful it is to the rest of the class. Uh, and these sentences God helped me to use to get a little bit of order in the classroom. And uh, I also got a wife out of the deal and a bunch of kids and some cool stories. And now maybe life is almost comfortable again. It's really scary. I'm really scared by that. It's a pretty decent little groove with work, school, the family. And so what if maybe God's opening the door to be a pastor at a church? Not just visit and like, ooh, you guys have some problems. I'm going to see you later. <laughs> and I'm not going to get in with you in them. What if God invites me to that and I need to step out? If he does, I will. I will step out. I will leap. I've been looking to see Jesus. I long to be with him, serving him. I will take that leap. Uh, I will take some knocks. I get knocked around. But I have learned that Jesus is faithful. How about you? What would Peter do? What will you do? Do you see Jesus out there in the neighborhood? In some of the announcements, opportunities to serve, and a chance to fill in. Do you want to be part of that? You might see some miracles. You'll get tighter with the miracle maker. There's something to be said for that. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for the challenge to seek you, to seek your ministry, how you long to be with us and we can demonstrate Christ-likeness and following you out there. Pray, Lord, that if we're comfortable, you would make us uncomfortable, that we would get uncomfortable with our comfort and that we would... Um, be willing to take that risk and to take a step of faith in following you. And that we would learn through experience that, Lord, you are faithful and you are so good. Pray that you receive all the honor and the glory for this. In Jesus' name, amen.
would like to stand. We'll stand and continue in worship.
Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand up on you, Jesus, you're my. And she didn't drown either, so okay. <laughs> and Deb, thank you so much for helping us out. I want to close uh, the service and send you out with a prayer, a prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those called his holy people who are in his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him on a place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. I want to send you out with that prayer this morning that God would teach you and strengthen you and give you what you need to go through this week and give you the courage to step out of the boat when the chance comes. Father, Go with us, guide us, bless us, and cause us to be a blessing to those around us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to serve you and keep in mind that you're there and that we can step out on the water and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.